I think I'll get started. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to um, the Seed Library Summit. I'm really excited about this event. I think this is the culmination of years of work from a lot of people. So congratulations to all of you. I've always seen the seed library movement as one of the most important, if not one, the most important development in this part of the century in our culture. I think we're finally, I'm, I feel like I'm preaching to the crowd, but I don't have to, uh, to ex because I don't have to explain, you know, exactly what that means or why. It's really great for me to be able to be here. Um, I am outside at a Starbucks in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm working on another seed project here today. And so um, they won't let me in Starbucks, and so I'm outside. So if there's any background noise, I apologize. So I'm Bill McDorman. I um, work for the Rocky Mountain um, Seed Alliance. Frances Craig is right there. You might be able to see her next to me. She um, is uh, helping us today and also works for the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. Um, I'm here for one specific purpose, and that is to give you a, a clear and concise summary of what's going on with seed patenting and how that will affect seed libraries and how it does affect them. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm not sure how long the battery on this laptop will last. So if I disappear, Francis is more than welcome to take questions, write them down. If she can't answer them, she's actually very, very competent. So. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started and uh, share my screen and uh, if you have questions, you can start to put them in the chat. Otherwise, we'll save them until we're finished. All right. So we're okay. All right. So um, at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, we've been watching sort of the seed patenting uh, issue for a number of years. And it's gotten critically important, I think, for us all to pay attention to it in the last um, uh, couple of years, especially. And that is because of the advent of um, uh, certified organic seeds that are now being uh, patented in the United States most popular organic seed catalogs. And so um, I'm showing you, uh, we now have a patent free seed campaign at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. This is our webpage. Um, if you want to sign up there, we'll keep you updated in what we're learning. This past summer, uh, it was last summer, we convened 50 um, seed leaders from around the world to talk about it and had sort of a steering committee. And the idea is that we will roll out a nationwide patent-free seed campaign. We have this logo that's already um, been drawn up and you're welcome to uh, download and get a copy of that and start putting it on things if you'd like to do that. We also are coming up with a pledge. We hope to finalize that language so that um, seed companies and seed buyers everywhere can pledge not to buy or sell patented seeds. It's that simple. And the reason, of course, why we want to do that is that you can't save or share patented seeds. And so this is the most restrictive um, uh, intellectual property ever um, applied to seeds in human history. And we think it's unacceptable. So if you want or need a more complete understanding of the history of how we got to this point, by allowing what we call utility patents or regular patents, the kinds you would have on, on new software or new inventions, um, then I suggest that you go to our page at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and our Patent Free Seed Campaign page. And you can, I just um, uh, hooked in a video by Dr. Margot Bagley, who teaches uh, patent law at Emory University. I met Margot in Rome at, the, uh, at an FAO international conference on, pat, on plant genetics. And um, she came online when we did our um, patent free seed um, steering committee meeting and gave about a half hour synopsis of uh, plant patenting law in the United States. And so I highly recommend that if you want a more in depth than I'm going to go into today. What I'm gonna do is kind of, um, uh, hit the high points and then tell you why, uh, show you some uh, examples of why this is such a critical issue right now. So the reason I uh, uh, got uh, 
my interest in this got elevated is starting about three or four years ago, I started seeing patented seeds in our nation seed catalogs. And there's some along the bottom are the names of some of the most popular ones. And those are those um, patented seeds, and these are certified organic, and in many cases, they're open pollinated. These are the seeds that are easy to save, like lettuce and peppers, all right? They're being supplied by those three companies across the top there. These are wholesale production companies that are then supplying seeds to high mowing Johnny's and Territorial, among others. And uh, just to give you an idea of how the organic seed market is changing is, you know, when I got, when we first started seeing organic seed, it was the savior. This was it. We were going to win, right? Because we had access finally to seeds um, with people that had a consciousness like ours, right? Let's make agriculture sustainable in the long run. Organic is the label. This is what we're going to work on. Well, in the intervening years, as you can see, you know, um, in uh, now the projections are in, in 2024 that organic um, seed will be a $5.4 billion market. This It's become big industrial agriculture. And I think that flavors everything that goes on here. I mean, and this is even to the point, this is Organic Seed Alliance. This is their website. This has just changed. The last time I went on, this is no longer there. But for a couple of years, up until recently, you could go to the Organic Seed Alliance, one click, and, and find their Organic Seed Finder. And you could click on that link. And two clicks later, you could be into finding a variety of lettuce that was certified organic. And you could click and buy the seed and have no idea that selling that was um, patented had a carried a utility patent. There just wasn't any label. And I brought this up over and over to Organic Seed Alliance. I said, you guys just can't do this. At least put on there a warning that you may be buying utility patented seed. And they said, Bill, you're the only one who cares. Nobody cares. And, I, and, and I, coming from the seed library movement side of things, I mean, this makes incredible um, sense for us to care about this. And so um, obviously they finally got the message and they changed, but I'm just giving you a, uh, I love Organic Seed Alliance. I love all the materials and the things they've done, but this just shows you how much power this new movement has and how it's kind of being hidden. And so I just want to make one distinction as we go into this. There's two different levels of patenting, so to speak, in the United States for, for seeds. Um, in 1970, the only real legislation around protecting plants and seed, and, and seed producing plants was um, passed. It's the Plant Variety Protection Act. And that was during the Nixon administration. And they argued back and forth in Congress. And they finally allowed a certain list of seed producing plants to finally be protected for 20 years. This is not patenting, however. This is in the USDA. It's a completely separate program from patents but it gave patent-like protection for 20 years to plants that were on the list. The most important part of the PVPA Act, though, however, was at the bottom there, it gave a breeder's exemption and a farmer's exemption. And what that meant was that farmers could still save their own seeds. So if you bought a PVP protected variety, you could still save the seed. All right, this is what for 10,000 years, this is what every farmer and gardener has been able to do is save their own seeds. Now, the PVP said you can't sell them and you can't share them. And this then would apply to seed libraries. But however, this is not plant patenting. So in 1980, a Supreme Court case allowed utility patents, regular kinds of patents to be applied to seed producing plants for the very first time. And so this is from the Johnny Selected Seed Catalog, trying to summarize what this um, uh, Supreme Court case uh, um, ruled. And it's then been updated by two more really important Supreme Court cases. And again, if you want that whole history, you want the names, want the references, Dr. Bagley's um, lecture is really, really great for that. I'm just going to, there it is. Seeds can only be used for crop production. They cannot be used for seed saving, replanting, resale, giving away, or use in any breeding program. In other words, there is no 
farmer's exemption. There's no breeder's exemption. In fact, if you look at some of the language on the packets that come from some of those companies, especially Vitalis, you're not even supposed to allow the plant to go to seed. In a sense, you're violating what their expectation is for this patent, all right? And so I immediately, when I started seeing utility patented seeds in the Johnny's catalog, this was four years ago now, I started writing to them. And this is what I get back. I write every year, and this is what I get back from them. No master list that contains all the patented or protected varieties exists. Okay, well, I'm saying we've got 82 seed libraries in the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, you know, uh, constellation. These are libraries that are set up for us. We need to know right? We don't want to break the law. We don't want patented materials to be passed out that are not supposed to be saved. And how can we know if there's no list? Johnny, send us a list. What they said was to go to the uh, United States Patented Trade Office website and, um, and search yourself. You can find them all there. So I did. I tried. There's a picture of what the website looks like. You can find lettuce um, varieties when you search for variety names. I searched for all 99 varieties of Johnny Selected Seeds lettuces for sale to see if they were patented or not. And some came up like Newham, but, and I went to the uh, Plant Variety Protection Act um, website and I searched there to see if anything had a PVP because that we don't want those in our seed libraries either. And, um, and I search and what I came up with is 78 of the 99 variety names are not traceable in either of those databases. So Johnny's answer is incomplete. There's no way to find them if you just do what they said to do. So then I started searching and I started, I went to Oh, Bill, you're muted for some reason. Just all of a sudden. All yep. Right. Okay, you're good now. All right. So what I did was I um, did my own search of, of 2021. I've done this every year now for four years. And I did my own search, um, um, back crossing, going to uh, wholesale suppliers, trying to put together lists as best I could to find out what was really patented in the Johnny's catalog. And these are the statistics I came up with. The 56 out of 99 varieties in the Johnny Selected Seed Catalog in 2021 are protected, okay? 46 out of the 99 carry utility patents now. 36 have PVP protection, and yet only 21 of them are searchable. So what that means, and when we asked um, Dr. Bagley about this, she said, What's probably gonna to have to happen is an NGO is gonna to have to keep putting energy into this and coming up with their own list. If we want a list that every librarian can have so that we can just check against it and easily see if something in our library is patented, we're gonna to have to come up with that list ourselves. And so I have a list of the lettuces I'm starting on, but I need everyone's help. And I suggest that coming out of this Seed Library Summit is some sort of concerted or coordinated effort to build this list. And so if you'll sign up on our website, if you want to right now for patenting, as soon as this gets going, we'll make sure everybody that um, is in our universe knows about and how we do this uh, collectively, we need to decide. All right, so here's some examples of why it's so hard. This is a lettuce, this was a couple of years ago on the Johnny site. Um, Salanova, it's one of the most popular lettuces there. And um, if you look down here at the bottom, it says, these are the utility patent numbers that, uh, that protect this lettuce. Well, if you search for Salanova, it never comes up there. It's traits within Salanova that are patented. And that's why it makes it so hard to search. Now, when you go to Salanova, they don't even give you these utility patent numbers anymore. And so they're even changing their things. Now, some of the lettuces are marked in the Johnny's catalog. And here's an example of how they do it. It's sort of hidden in the text. So you have to start looking very, very carefully. And I found four mistakes, four varieties that were not marked at all, that have utility patents that Johnny just doesn't even talk about. When I wrote to them and asked them to update that, they said, well, you know, we're out in the field. Maybe this fall when we come in and do our new catalog, we'll update it correctly. But right now it doesn't bother us. 
And I wrote back and I said, this is unacceptable. We have people buying your seeds and, and, and they're saving lettuce seeds and they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing and you guys don't care. And when I did that three times, I got banned from their customer service, okay? They let me back in after a year, so it's okay. But I was just, I was not angry. I wasn't, I was just persistent in trying to figure out how to do this. Now, high mowing, you know, here's an example of an open pollinated certified organic pepper that's PVP protected. And this is how you would know on the high mowing site that that is the case. Now, to their credit, for the first time this year, I got back a list from high mowing of everything that they have utility patented on their site. And that's helping me to build the list. And so uh, hats off to those guys. I, apparently they had a huge discussion among their employees. And I think the only way to change this kind of behavior that I'm still getting at Johnny's is for all of us, every time we buy seeds, every time you see somebody who buys seeds from them to have them ask for a list. And as soon as enough customers do it, I think they'll come or all come around. Territorial is another story at this point. Here's a, 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 a patented letter, you, uh, lettuce, utility patented lettuce, and there's no talk about it whatsoever. They don't even talk about utility patents on the website at all. You could be buying lettuce that has utility patents that nobody knows or cares about there. So um, this was from Dr. Bagley's um, lecture, you know, to give you an idea of how many are actually being patented. This is a relative chart last year of the number of varieties that have now been um, utility patented in the United States. As you can see, Monsanto, which is now Bayer, owns the lion's share of those. And um, th this again is from her, lect uh, her lecture. Um, patent law pr provides absolute protection. So every farmer that has found utility patented material growing on their fields through contamination, through mistakes, they didn't know it was there and were sued by Monsanto, um, the suit was upheld. And what the court said was, we don't care how it got there. We don't care if you didn't know, it's still a patent infringement. So what does all that mean for seed libraries? Well, just to a little bit of background, one of the websites that went, when I was searching for utility patents or whatever, I saw this thing, a reference to AIB. And I go, what is AIB? So I went to the website and it turns out that that's a new anti-infringement bureau started worldwide by the companies I listed some of them there and Bejo and Inzazad are the ones selling the most utility patented seed, certified organic seed in the United States. So they're part of this bureau and their mission is to find anybody who grows and or distributes, shares or sells utility patented seed. And so if you dig a little deeper into their website, you get language like this. This is right off their website. Production use and trading of illegal products is an important source for financing organized crime. That's how they see this. So, so patented seeds being shared by a seed library in this kind of a strict definition is organized crime. That's how we're being viewed. And now there's a new US version of this, SIPA. Seed Innovation and Protection Alliance, and they've got an 800 number, and they give rewards if you'll call and, and snitch on people that are known to be saving, sharing, or selling utility patented seeds. This is, this is what we're up against. This is how, how this is viewed by industry. And so I'm just going to summarize here at the end. I'll open it up for any questions. If you remember when the seed library was shut down in Pennsylvania a few years ago. So um, uh, there was a really great response from the seed library people, from Rebecca especially, and um, uh, the Sustainable uh, Economies Law Center, and a few others. And actually, Belle, my wife, was on a committee that was formed to meet with the Association of American Seed Control Officials. The fellow that shut down that seed library in Pennsylvania was a member of this national organization. And what that organization has done is come up with what they call the Russell, which is the recommended uniform seed laws, okay? And these laws then are recommended to every state. 
to make things uniform across the whole United States. And so what we tried to do, and it took a year of back and forth, was get an amendment to Russell that allowed seed libraries. So no more seed control officials would shut down no more seed libraries so that they would understand. And believe me, it was a battle in the beginning. They did, first of all, they didn't understand what seed libraries were. It took a lot of time. And then they had all these fears about not just weeds and all sorts of stuff. But finally, after a year, they agreed to allow seed libraries with some uh, specific requirements and language. And one of those was that each seed library would have to have a sign. And the sign must state that patented seed or varieties protected by the PVP, uh, Plant Variety Protection Act, will not be accepted or distributed, all right, through the seed library. That's the requirement. And I don't know if all of you have heard of this or whatever, but what I want to tell you is that do that because that will give you protection in the current environment. So one of the things Dr. Bagley came on to our um, seed uh, teacher training course that we're doing right now at the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And she was just on answering questions this past Wednesday. And one of the things she said was, you know, we know that farmers can get sued if they are saving seeds or have varieties that they're not supposed to have growing on their property varieties they don't own, all right? But what happens if it's a seed library? What if you have patented material in your seed library? And she said, as long as you don't know that it's patented, there's another requirement, there's another hurdle that the company would have to have if it was to hold you legally liable. And that requirement is willfulness. In other words, you would have to be willfully, not just have it in your library, but say, hey, we are growing and sharing this on purpose because it's utility patented. So the way you can protect your seed library is to have the sign that the Russell Amendment recommends. That sign says, We're, we don't do this. We are not sharing or, or, or willingly taking on or distributing seeds to patented or PVP material. So as long as you have your sign up, that shows that you are not willfully doing this, okay? And that will protect you. And that's my message today for seed libraries. There's a couple of them. One, uh, understand that, you know, it was 28% of the varieties in Johnny's two years ago that were patented. Now it's 46%. The aim of these companies is to have it all, all of the lettuce varieties patented, okay? This, and these lettuce varieties are going to what we call controlled environment agriculture, which they, a lot of people call the future of agriculture, right? University of Arizona doesn't teach any other kind of agriculture. This, these are the greenhouses on top of Whole Foods, right? That are growing the greens all over the country. Now 46% of those seeds are patented, all right? And they wanna patent them all, all right? So it's growing exponentially. That's message number one. Number two, the only way we're gonna get lists and know what these are and to stop this practice is to ask the companies to respond as consumers. Every time we interact, we need to call them out. There are friends, I love, Rob Johnson's a friend of mine, right? But this behavior is not acceptable. As, as Margot Bagley says, the more they keep this under the radar, they're, they're on purpose trying to keep this shady. The whole patenting thing is kept shady in order for it to keep growing, right? Without question, and we need to question it. So question it, teach your members how to question it. And number three message is put up your sign, all right? And let's join the world. In Europe, they've got uh, no patents on seed campaigns. There are 80 organizations that have joined it. They've been fighting for years. And finally, finally, late last summer, they got a ruling in the European Union Supreme Court that for the first time defined a boundary around utility patented plants. And what they said was that Oh, we're not going to fight utility patents. You can apply those to plants, but you can only apply them to plants that are genetically modified, that are genetically engineered. Those are new inventions. And our whole universe in organic agriculture and everything we're trying to do, you know, is outside of that. So we'll give you that. We don't buy GMOs. We don't want them anyway. But what the court then said was that any plant variety 
that is derived from essentially biological processes by traditional breeding techniques that ends up in traditional varieties of lettuce, like all 46.5% of the varieties in Johnny's catalog. Any of those varieties, they cannot be utility patented. This should be the standard in the United States too. It's a no brainer. And so we need to build awareness around a, a patent free C campaign in the United States, I believe around those boundaries. So I'm going to uh, uh, stop sharing and um, I can answer any questions. And maybe um, do you have any that have come over um, the chat um, that you wanna start with Francis or yeah, to... I can go ahead and share the ones that I've recorded. Um, somebody is wondering about uh, Baker Creek and rare seeds. If you know anything about their um, their seeds, seed offering, if any of them are utility patented. I am, I am very happy that one of the most uh, enthusiastic supporters in our steering committee for a, a nationwide patent-free seed campaign was um, Jared from Baker Creek. He said, we'll put the symbol in the catalog. We'll uh, put language about the pledge on there. They have no utility patented or protected varieties in their catalog. And they believe really strongly in this, um, in this movement. And between them and um, a couple other orga national organizations, um, Seed Savers Exchange was represented. I think we have the start of a, a, a groundbreaking movement. Thank you. Good question. We had another question. Somebody's wondering if you could share the high mowing list of what they have um, PVP and utility patented. I have not. I, I got that. It's pretty short. And so um, uh, Francis knows we're in the business of right now of updating our website. And so very soon I plan on putting up the first list of all the lettuces and the research we've done and high mowings list. And I invite if you interact with any other seed companies that know any other patented varieties or want to make them public and have any other list, let me know and I'll make sure that those are up on our on our website. And you're welcome to copy that on your own websites. Again, at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, we're not here to own or control any information. We give everything away. So we're just here to help and to pass on information. Thank you, Bill. Um, we have another question from Tess. Do you know anything about Burgess? I'm assuming that that's a, that's a seed company. Tess, would you maybe like to unmute yourself and share? Yeah, so Burgess um, is a seed company, Burgess Farm and Seeds. Um, we're in Ohio, so they're, they might be more this way, but we had somebody who wants to donate a bunch of Burgess seeds, and I just wanted to make sure before we went and put them in the library that they aren't, and none of them are protected by patents, and I I'm just not even sure like what to look for when I cross reference them on the website. So. You know, yeah, good question. And this is the question, right? So the first thing to do is ask them. I did write them. I wrote their customer service last week and asked them if they had any patent and seeds or how they listed on their website. I haven't heard back from them yet, but I just wrote them on Thursday and they said it could take four to five days to even respond to me. Well, you so. know, there's a lot of good people. And so the language I use when I write them now is, do you have any protected seeds? Okay, and that makes that's sense. Impor that's important because of the old, you know, family and these kinds of seed companies around also sell larger amounts of feed seed and others. And those kinds of seeds are now coming with a contractual protections. You know, sometimes they've got... Um, uh, MTAs attached to them, which are material transfer agreements and other sorts of stuff. So the language that these companies may understand better is protected. Okay. And, and you can just be upfront. They're not, nobody's really trying to be nefarious. And in all honesty, they may not know. You may be the first person to have asked. Well, and I, um, I also tried getting a hold of high mowing because we have a bunch of high mowing seeds also that were 
donated by high mowing. So I'm guessing they're not protected ones because they wouldn't give us those likely, but they may not have known. Right, I would not assume that. And what I know about high mowing is that they um, uh, uh, put in their written paper catalog. I have that. Okay, um, I, I was disappointed that their website had not been updated. I found patented varieties on their website that were not marked yet. I'll but check the written sure. catalog. Yeah. So, but um, if you get a paper, what do I look for with that? Well, like how it, do they? It'll be in. It'll be in the written description somewhere. And okay. Be, and um, and it'll say utility patent granted. Okay, I will. Um, I will look because I do have their current catalog. They send me one each year. Great. Um, now, and if I were a librarian, I would document this. I oh would, yeah, I, I document would everything. To purchase and ask. I wrote to I'm moving. I check their catalog and then put up your sign, and then you you should be protected. You're showing willfulness to try to do this. It's not your fault if you can't find out. We had um, an issue recently once with somebody who posted on a social media site of the library where I work about how we're illegally distributing seeds. And our PR person had to work with me. Um, we've had our seed library since 2018 to kind of go back, but then I wanted to attend this so that I could know what to do in the future, how to have enough information that I can say, no, we're not. And here's why. Right. Well, so each state can have its own laws, you know, and so in each state has a seed control official. And so um, the laws are still really weird in some states. And so, but what I would do is you can download, you can just go online and get a copy of the RSSL, the, you know, recommended seed laws. And yeah, and have a copy of that and say, look, I understand what you're trying to do. It you're doing your job at your state level or whatever, but this is nationally what they've all decided, and we are following the national rules. And that'll just give you some legal backup. It shows them that you know what you're doing legally, and 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 that's enough to get them to back down in a lot of cases. Again, Re Rebecca's way more up on what's happening nationally around these things than I am. Thank you. So we have some questions coming in about um, heirloom seeds being patented. Some folks thought that uh, heirloom seeds are safe. Other folks are saying that um, even heirloom seeds are being patented now. Well, you know, so it's shady. You know, what, what Dr. Bagley says is this, that, you know, if you were involved in a legal case around property, the first thing you would do is get out the meets and bounds you would have the property defined, right? Well, it's not like that in patents around plants. It's hazy. And so because it's hazy, you know, it's really hard to tell. So one of the requirements for filing a utility patent is it's gotta be distinct and different than things that are in the public domain, okay? And so that can be interpreted in different ways. If it's a really unique heirloom that no one's seen before, a company could argue that it's distinct. This is a one-off and we're gonna patent it because we found it and the law allows that, all right? The other thing they can do is patent a trait within the variety. So in other words, this is what Frank Morton's up against at Wild Garden Seed. Turns out that the, a color of burgundy in lettuce has been patented. So what does that mean? As Frank says, I've got about 80 different varieties of lettuce I'm working with. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a open source um, lettuce breeder. Um, does that mean that I could put years into coming up with a new burgundy lettuce and then the company's gonna come in later and tell me that that color burgundy is patented when I couldn't figure out what it was in the first place? And the answer is yes. At this stage of things, unfortunately, it's yes. Now there's one really famous case of a yellow bean in Mexico that somebody found in a market down there that had a distinct yellow 
uh, color that was brought back to the U.S. and grown out for a number of years and then sold commercially and then patented. The color yellow was patented. And um, it took 10 years of lawsuits by international organizations largely challenging that idea because it's horrifying to think that somebody could just find an heirloom and patent it. And that was finally struck down. So uh, that's the other side of the case. And where we live is somewhere in between. So I hope that answer helps you. I, I have a question. I don't know if I'm, I don't want to interrupt if I'm. No, you're fine. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Gina. So, oh, thank you. Um, so I'm so overwhelmed right now. When we started our heirloom seed library um, collection, when we began it, which is about six years ago, before we even started our, our collections in the public library, and so we check with the Missouri Department of Agriculture because essentially we didn't know, it, it, we didn't want to run into any trouble saying that we were, you know, doing something inappropriate. And they said, as long as you're not selling the seeds, you're fine. And so we've used Baker Creek and another company that's in Missouri called White Harvest Seed Company. And so the seeds that go into the collection are, we purchase and put heirloom seeds in there. But the thing that just gets me is that at the same time, near July or whatnot, we have gone to Walmart and Lowe's and whatnot, and they donate to us their GMO, their seeds, whatever's left over. So when we have seed swaps, we will just give those away, but they're not in the collection. We also will give them to like someone who's any groups that are starting community gardens or whatnot, we would prefer to do all heirloom, but this is what we've been able to do. And so we're, we've recently just, just this year, partnered with a local Springfield Community Gardens to start and install a couple heirloom seed beds to grow and harvest our own seeds. So at this point, I am so overwhelmed. I'm just going to see about, you know, creating the signage for that you recommended, but also, I guess, checking with High, White Harvest Seed Company. Am I missing a step here? And I think what they're doing is just awful. Well, so you're not missing a step. You're doing exactly the right thing. Put your sign okay. up and okay. ask. And those show okay. diligence. That, you, okay. that will protect you legally. In okay. the end, probably. I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice out, right? But but from what I understand, there is another another you know level at which this sort of thing happens. And so um, you're doing exactly the right thing. I, you know, and again, I don't want to scare people. We shouldn't be overwhelmed, but we should be aware of what's going on. And that's you're mm -hmm. exactly right. Um, and um, it's really possible that some of the seeds now that are coming through Walmart or whatever or you know could be that way and that's why helping us build a list would be really important too then we've got even another we say look we're putting energy into building a list we try to keep track of do you have a list we have one right and if yeah. our list isn't isn't complete then help us make it complete that's all we're really after it will be their fault if we don't have a complete list and i keep asking every year i just go through the whole list of companies and i write them and ask them. One year I got a, an answer back from Vitalis, which is Enzazod. It's a chemical company from Germany. And uh, one year I, I got an answer back. There was only one year and they said, oh, that's easy. All, all of our varieties are patented. You know, so. Thank you so much. Thanks for answering my question. Thanks, Bill. We have somebody wondering if um, if you know anything about Canada's seed patenting regulations. Um, they seem to believe that Canada follows the guidelines that the United States follows. Well, you know, there you know the famous case is Percy Smyser. You know um, that, and that was under uh, U.S. contract law, and, and it was applied in Canada, of course. They go. That's the problem. These laws are being used to stifle seed saving, and and, and as a result, independence of farmers all over the world. You know, we're kind of we're just building our own you know sort of peasant seed movement and trying to catch up with the rest of the world. But you know, in Africa, there are 55 million farmers, and at 60 percent of those people are are uh, adhering to U.S utility patent laws 
not because they have to. There's an international treaty all those co countries have signed that says um, when it comes to seeds, patent law doesn't apply, all right? You don't have to in Africa adhere to these laws. And yet 65% of those countries um, do even pass their own national laws doing that. Why? Because they were browbeaten into doing that in order to join the WTO and these other things. But it's all US law. That's why it's so important for us to take the responsibility. We need to change this here. And our goal should be the same as Europe. Sure, you can patent stuff. Sure, you can have protection, but it's only your genetically modified garbage, okay? Leave the rest of the 10,000 years of diversity that we collectively you know, created, leave that alone, all right? Thank you, Bill. Um, we have two questions regarding liability. So somebody is wondering that they just started a seed library and they packed everything in envelopes that they created. Um, they're wondering if the sign will cover them. The Russell recommended you know, sign. Well, yeah, I'm, you know, from what I know, there, there are, there's nothing legally to make us think differently. In other words, you're not growing and selling the seeds. That's, you know, or sharing them or saving them for your own use again. If you're doing that with utility patented seeds, you know, the courts have been pretty clear. You can't do that. But if you are unknowingly sharing them, then they would have to prove something else. If they brought a legal case against you, they would have to, they would have to prove that you are willful, that you are doing this knowingly and you're doing it on purpose. And so if you've got your sign up and you're doing your best to help us build a list or whatever, you know, that's the opposite of that. And I think that would give us protection. And again, you never know. We're up against the world's largest corporations, you know, and a member of our Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, used to be an attorney for Monsanto. So that's the kind of mentality that's involved here. And we, you never say never. But collectively, we can band together. Wouldn't it be nice? if corollary to the seed library movement in America was this idea that we all wanted to do the right thing. We've got our signs. We're trying to obey the law. We just want to share our own seeds. That would be admissible as evidence in any kind of court case, all right? Thank you. We have another question. Um, we are sponsored by our state land grant university and housed at the city library. I fear that if either gets a whiff of this issue, they'll shut us down out of trepidation around legal issues. How do we deal with informing them of the issue and danger? Well, the first thing I would do is show them the Russell Amendment. Say, well, you may want to do that, but you are not being legally consistent with the uh, National Association of Seed Control officials which looked into the legality of this for a year and has decided that seed libraries do not fall under um, any sort of um, uh, extra legal you know, definitions. In other words, they're totally and completely legally legal if they do the following things. And I would start your discussion there. Then, you know, if it were my land grant, I would go hard and heavy on the fact that the original charter of the land grants was to do exactly this. In fact, one could argue in the 1850s and 60s and 70s, land grant universities were started in every state in the United States largely to be big seed libraries. This is their original mission. And language around that has gotten awakened them. You know, it's just been, you know, another anniversary for the great land grants. And there's a lot of discussion about how they've drifted from their mission. And many of them now require protection for new varieties that are developed within the university. And it is in their financial interest not to have people, you know, distributing seeds for free. So you've got an epic battle there, but let us all know. I think if that happens, you let us know. That would be a great case to bring to national awareness. And I think that we would have a real good case um, publicly, if not legally, to shame them if they tried to do that.
We have another question about, um, this is with a lot of the seed patenting has been discussed with food seeds, vegetables. Um, is there a concern for flower seeds as well? Oh yeah. 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 Again, you know, they're keeping this as shady as they can, you know? So what's happening is that, you know, started with the Bush administration and it was, you know, hyper pushed in the Trump administration. Let's not hire people to work there. Let's not increase their budget. So the U S patent and trade office is way understaffed. So what that means is when somebody comes in with they want to patent something, usually there's a back and forth. Somebody at the patent and trade office says, whoa, 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 that's too wide. That's too undefined. You can't patent that. Go back, make your language better, narrow it down. Well, that narrowing down is not happening anymore. And a record number of patents are being granted. And so it's just like open season in the candy store. So we're in this legal environment where all sorts of stuff. Do you realize that... Um, heat tolerance in brassicas has been patented. If you go, it's a horrifying thing to go through the US Patent and Trade Office searching for lettuce patents and start looking through and seeing what else is being patented. Not only Frank Morton's Burgundy, but this other stuff. So just be aware this is really, you know, on the one hand, that's really scary. On the other hand, it means that there's gonna be a lot of legal redefinition down the road. It's going to be really expensive for somebody to fight these things, but um, it will probably not end up where it is. And so we're just going to have to live with that for now. Thank you, Bill. Does anybody want to unmute and um, share uh, their seed library project or any concerns that they have with seed patenting? Hello? Hi, yeah, go right ahead, we can hear you. Hi, I wanted to say thank you so much for this. And instead of feeling frightened, I feel empowered that if I, starting from, this, from scratch, you know how to go about doing it. And the people I've heard speak, they're so diligent that I wish them well, and I have every confidence that they'll be all right. But thank you, I feel empowered. And I know what to avoid and what to consider. And as we're teaching younger generations, this is absolutely something they need to know. So thank you. I had asked this in the chat and I don't, I don't know if it's in there. I was trying to look and find it. Is there an example of the signage to put up anywhere for us? Let me, oh. Here's the, let me share my screen again, real quick. Can I, this is Sarah from the Community Seed Exchange. And um, my understanding is that I think either on Richmond Grows or seedlibraries.com, there is a template that Rebecca and I put together. We created a template that is the right words. So I would start, I don't know where it is exactly, but I think it's, I, um, it's on either of those two sites, there's a, there should be one. Yeah, use those examples. The, the, these guys are way farther down the road. What I would do is if you um, just um, uh, Google R-U-S-S-L, a uh, PDF of the amendment comes up and the exact language for the sign is in there. You could craft using that language. I am looking for it so that I can share the link in the chat, but I think we have another question to address. Um, do you know of any other seed companies like Baker Creek that don't patent any of their seeds? Oh yeah, there are a lot. This whole new wave of small companies, the other people that were represented at our meeting were the Experimental Farm Network. People were there, um, almost all of the small see companies. I, you know, there's a hundred, I think, listed in a directory on the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance site. None of those people, they've been, you know, we're, we're coming through our own school, our grassroots seed school together, you know, in a sense, and, and have learned a different value to, to promote diversity. And so none of those people, I mean, utility patents are just the most horrific sounding thing. If you're, if, if you're trying to promote 
diversity. And so, you know, what's happened is that I could talk about it in another way. What's happened is with the rise of the new organic, especially um, uh, market gardeners that are supplying farmers markets and restaurants in and around cities in the United States, which has become a huge part of this, you know, billion dollar organic industry. As that's grown up, seed catalogs to supply them have grown up. And that's why Johnny's, Johnny's is a $60 million a year company now. When I had my little seed company, High Altitude Gardens, I tried to do research and the whole mail order seed universe in the United States, and this was like 25 years ago, was $50 million. So now we have one company that's $60 million. High mowing is about $6 million a year, just to give you some example. They're the next probably. And territorial on the, on the West Coast, those three companies supply a large share of the seeds that go to those market farmers. And those are the targets for these European companies that are patenting. That's what they're trying to do. It's not worth it to them to go into small little you know, outlets. They're trying to hit the majority of the market with very few distributors. And so those are the ones that you have to be careful of, all right? Oh, Fedco Seeds also offered huge support, of course. They're, you know, they, from the very beginning have been, their mission is the opposite of allowing patented material. Again, but we all have that problem still of trying to get a list of what actually is being patented. So here's a really great question from Pam. Um, if I have seeds in our seed library marked just marigold without a specific variety name, should I remove these seeds since I can't verify if they are patented? No. No, I think we should do everything we can to find out what is patented. But, um, you know, in a sense, the burden rests on the patent holder. I mean, in the end, legally, that, that's where it should be. As, as I said, the courts, if you're going to grow, I, you know, if you're really paranoid, I, you know, you may not want to take them home and grow them and sell the seeds to a variety of marigold unless you know exactly, you know, whether those things, because the courts could roll, rule against you. But as far as sharing them in the seed library, again, as long as you are not willfully sharing patented material, you're, you should be okay. Bonnie, I'm wondering if you would like to share um, the tomato seed story uh, from your, your parents' seeds. If you'd like to unmute yourself and share that. I did, thank you. Uh, yeah, my parents have been gardeners for years and they grew this tomato they called um, pepper-shaped tomatoes because they're long, they don't have a lot of seeds in. I'm sure it's a plum variety or a paste variety. So each year we would save them and grow them and they grow true to seed. But I put them in the food or the food library, the seed library, and just wondering how do I label those then, or just label them as source unknown. Um, I don't know what to do in a case like that. Um, so let me tell you what's happening is that, you know, it's very expensive to patent something. Okay. Very expensive. And so it's only being done to things that have larger, you know, um, what I'll call now organic industrial level, right? I mean, because it's become a billion dollar industry, you know, it's starting to get to the level where people can make it work. And, and what is being patented are open pollinated, easy to see, save things that are not hybridized normally. Right. All right. So, you know, if you can hybridize something, it's way cheaper to do that. And then that keeps people from saving the seeds. And that's why hybridization is being so used. So the first targets that I can find for patenting of seeds are organic because they carry a premium. In other words, regular varieties of lettuce seed are not being patented. The only ones I've found are certified organic. And it's lettuce and a few peppers. I have yet to find a, a patented tomato that's available to the public that you would find and grow and save or do whatever. And so I'm just telling you at this point, we're still pretty lucky. Now, never say never. It doesn't mean that, that there isn't one out there. But I would say that the chances that you have a tomato now 
that's patented are really, really, they're slim or none. Oh, good. That's good to right? know. And again, willful. If you don't know the writing and you do checks, and then the other thing you can do is ask for lists wherever you go. I've tried to find all the list of all the patented tomatoes and nobody will tell me. So, you know, you're protected. You're showing that you're not willfully doing this. Okay. In fact, I would say you're showing the opposite. You're guilty. You know, you're feeling <laughs> bad about it. You know, that's all the law really wants you to feel. And that's what's so insidious about this whole thing. Keep it shady and make us all feel guilty. I have another quick question and I don't want to take up everybody oh, else's fine. time too, but we just started our seed library and we really want to make a success of it. We've put some income into it from our friends of the library group. We're asking people to save seed to return, right. but now this is going to put a whole new wrinkle on things if we say okay if you donate seed or you patent seed now or, or um, save seed then we have to worry about patents and then to ask people to find out all this information on their own um i don't know i'm getting a little discouraged yeah well here's what i would do if, if, if i'm not part of a seed library right now i'm i hope to i'm going to retire and and work in my local seed library. I think that's some of the most noble work being done. So bless you and bless you for starting, you know, being part of a new one. Um, you know, so um, we're gonna have a lettuce list up. Okay. I would check it. That's most likely what you'll find. There are a, a handful of peppers. That's really, and so, and I would keep that list at the library. Okay, great, wonderful. And so if people have a lettuce or a pepper, I'd check against the list and then let go. Sure. If we together update the list. Let's just keep this within our ball. And, and I will, you know, our organization, we're going to keep writing to all the companies. We're going to keep asking as a cover for everybody and saying, look, we're asking. Everybody's asking. And so if we happen to have something go through there, that's your fault, not ours. Wonderful. Thank well, you. Don't worry about it. Again, um, number one thing is to empower everybody to grow and save some seeds. And especially around making mistakes. We love mistakes. <laughs> Write them down when you check it back in. You know, we're here to create diversity. The worst thing that can happen if somebody makes a genetic mistake from your seed library is they still get to eat. They're still gardening. We love mistakes. You know, let's just learn to work through this together. And as your seed library matures, your seed savers will get better and your seeds will get better. And that's just how the evolution goes. But we all, we're the pioneers. We get to make all the mistakes and have fun. So empower everybody that comes in there and don't worry about this. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I, um, by way of notice, I have about 6% left in my laptop. So oh, okay. so. Maybe we can get through these last two minutes. We have one question in the chat and then Sarah has her hand up and that'll probably be it. So Christina wants to know if she, if she has a seed that's been saved and shared for many seasons and then a trait is patented, are those seeds then under the patent? Well, that would be a huge legal case, you know? Um, uh, the way the courts are ruling now, if they decided to come at you now, one of the other interesting things is um, there's a six year statute of limitations. Mm. In other words, if you can prove that you've been growing and saving it for six years and passing it around, you, you may have legal protection mm. depending on how they define that. So that's the number one thing. But if you're just growing and saving seed and it's patented, it doesn't matter what the reason is, right? If you're sharing it unknowingly, as I said, that gives you another, that gives them another burden of proof right they would have to prove that you're willfully doing that so uh, we'll just leave it at that and again do, uh, dr bagley's um agreed she works for organizations the african union and farmers organizations all over the world to figure out the nuances of the legal and so if you have extra questions you can email us at rockymountainseeds.org sign up for our patent free seed program you know and just to get notice we don't use the mailing list for anything else this is what we're trying to do with this this program and and we'll just keep you apprised to what's going on and we can we can answer all these questions for you but as i said overall 
um, let's feel empowered from this. I love that comment because that's what we're really trying to do today is give you enough information that you can be empowered. And we can rock this seed library movement because it really is the foundation of what we're doing. This will define whether or not our nation is successful in the next hundred years, I believe. There's never been a grassroots movement like this and it has to be grassroots. There is no outside institution whether it's a university, uh, a small bard, or anybody that has the money, the time, or the energy to create and preserve the diversity in each of our communities that we all need. All right? Why?